Okay. It's so, a requirement. So I'll give you an example. We ha I have a wellness clinic in my constituency, and they will, by the time this is all said and done, will have had to pay four months uh, rent on 11 days worth of income. And their landlord's refusing to apply for SECRA. Uh, and they also use subcontractors and they can't apply for any other Government of Canada programs, although there may be some relief with them with SEBA now. So what, what would I tell this, this tenant, Tammy, uh, about what are the prospects for her with the rent relief program? Um, we believe that there's some misinformation about the program. And as I said, we'll be releasing details on the 25th of May. And in, in, in that information, because I've actually just approved the text of that release myself, it's now going through other processes. There's information as to what a tenant can do to talk to its landlord about um, why, that, look, the alternative is very expensive litigation and collection from people. Um, uh, unless, uh, you know, in a healthy business, it would be irrational to not support a tenant. So it, we've heard from a lot of landlords and from tenants around this program. And one of the complexities of it is now the government has decided, both levels of government, that they'll provide a 50% rent subsidy. And now, but, but within that, there's a 25% picked up by the landlord, 25% picked up by the tenant. And I understand the landlords could pick up more. But there's, the, there's a, a complexity in it in that uh, there's common area costs, there's utility costs, there's a lot of things that landlords do. Wouldn't it yeah. make more sense to be able to say, listen, we'll pick up 50% of the rent given, uh, uh, given the, the situation that people are, they've been closed and allow the landlord and the tenant to come up with their own agreement as to what the other half looks like. Could be a blend and extend, it could be a variety of different things. And, and really, at the end of the day, as long as they attest that they've got an agreement, then they should be able to go forward. Um, we, you, you design these programs in a highly constrained, multiple constrained environment. One of the things we didn't want to do is overly interfere with negotiations between landlords and tenants. We didn't want to be bailing out failing businesses. Um, and we wanted to make sure that there was skin in the game on the part of landlords. Um, the, the nature of the rent relief agreement is a matter between the landlord and the tenant. Um, and, and, and we wanted to make sure it was clear to the landlords in order to help these tenants that we'd be willing to cover more than just the net rent, but the gross rent, as you say, including property taxes, common area costs, and utilities. So on the enforcement side, can you, can you elaborate? How are you going to be able to enforce this? Like, how are you going to make sure that the tenants uh, receive this money that's been owed to them? Thank you. Um, an important question. This is a forgivable loan. And so if the landlord, the only way the loan to the landlord gets forgiven is if the landlord plays by the rules and passes the, the savings on to the tenant and has to do so, so through an agreement. So that's the mechanism we'll use. That all cleared up, James, because yeah, we got thank you. We, thank you're over time. But and if you got a supplementary to finish this round, you're okay. No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. All right, uh, Ms. Uh, Zerowitz, uh, and then on to Mr. Morantz. Uh, Julie? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sedell. Thank you for being here, and thanks to Ms. Bowers for being here. Very important discussion. This won't surprise you. The number one issue uh, during the last campaign was affordable housing, and I'll tell you, with, uh, with this pandemic coming out of it, it'll continue to be a, a top issue for the residents in my riding of Davenport. I will tell you that we've had a number of uh, nonprofit organizations uh, want to uh, help build uh, some affordable housing options in yeah. the riding, but they have found that it's uh, they found the process a little bit onerous, a little bit long, not easy to, to, to engage in. And so my question is, in an era where, you know, I heard that you said we're trying to create 125,000 uh, new units over the next 10 years, and I know our need is so substantially much higher than that. Yeah. Um, what is it? And we're now in the era of agility and flexibility and trying to do the impossible. What can the federal government do at this point to help CMHC accelerate more affordable housing options? Well, I want to give Romy an opportunity to brag about um, your, your properly pointed uh, criticism about how hard it was to deal with us in the in first instance. Um, and that's a function. Uh, it's not Romy's fault. It's my mm -hmm. fault. We designed a program that um, we, I insisted we launch quickly. And uh, as a result, it was a little clunky to start. But Romy, could you just talk about what we've done to speed those processes up and then perhaps answer the question? Yeah, for sure. And uh, yes, yeah. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, to really put it simply, we've become a uh, 
a much more client-centric organization. I think before, we were, what we were trying to do is uh, not consider the needs of the client, but trying to fit people into different programs that we have. So the new mindset and the new processes that we have is to, in the first instance, understand what the needs of the client are, and then to try to find a solution for them. And, and, I, and I, I do apologize to your constituents who, who have had difficulty with our programs. I can assure you that, that there has been an effort underway for the last eight months to really look at our processes and to make significant improvements, uh, starting with uh, having detailed discussions with the clients before they even start the application process. So I hope uh, the fruits of that effort is uh, being, you know, slowly being felt, and uh, we're always very happy to have discussions with you. We have staff across all regions of Canada, and we're very happy to engage in these kind of discussions to make sure that the money is getting to the people who need it most. And, and as you probably know, recently there was an announcement uh, by, um, by the mayor of uh, Toronto to uh, announcing some uh, modular housing units that are being built in response to the COVID crisis. And again, uh, that's an example of uh, CMHC staff working very constructively with municipal leaders to make sure that uh, money is going where they're needed most. And I'll just add, uh, certainly more money is needed, but our plan, because the federal government has made substantial investments by the national housing strategy, is to make sure that um, provinces and territories are doing their part with match funding um, mm -hmm. and uh, and also the municipalities are helping us by speeding up approvals. So uh, that's, that gets me to my, uh, well, almost to my next question. You had mentioned a comment how home ownership uh, is lower in high income countries. Is that because there's more rental options, affordable rental options available? It is partly that. These are of course, many of them older economies uh, than ours. Um, uh, the other thing is that in newly developed economies, there seems to be a rush to ownership, and that skews the data a different way. Okay. And so then it gets me back to your comment around municipalities and provinces also have to step up around if we want more affordable housing or uh, options moving forward. You have this uh, comment about municipalities can continue to help by accelerating uh, the uh, affordable housing approvals, waiving fees, and, and a bunch of things. One of the things you don't mention is gentle density. Is that... Uh is that also a solution that should be put on the table as well? Well, I'd say rough density. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there was a study done, you know, because the supply function is so slow, um, the, the better way to attack affordability is densification. And uh, the levels of density we have in this country are very, very low by comparative standards. I know that um, the pandemic will cause people to be worried about densification. Um, there seems so far to be no evidence other than, of course, in long-term care facilities, which is a different case. The density is correlated with higher infection rates. Um, people live separately, after all. Uh, and, you know, I know in my building in Ottawa, I live in an apartment building, there's uh, steps to clean uh, common areas. So densification, and I would say, frankly, aggressive densification, not gentle densification, although that too is essential, is really what's required. And what does that look like? Is that is that, do you mean by that we should encourage more uh, building of rental units? Uh, what is it? Make it easier to have four story sort of buildings of just uh, rental apartments. What do you mean by that? That's what I mean. I mean, uh, frankly, attacking nimbyism um, okay. and and people complaining about higher density. It comes at the cost of ex of very expensive housing. And then can I just ask one more question? I just want to talk, ask a question around the modular housing because that to me was an excellent announcement. It is fast housing that's coming on apparently uh, on stream in September for homeless and the most vulnerable who don't have housing. Is that a model that we need to be investing more in moving forward? Romy, I'm going to give that one to you. The answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, definitely. And, and it's great that we're able to act so quickly. But, you know, fundamentally, we need to attack the source of homelessness. You know, it's, it's a, this, this is a bit of a temporary solution. But I think we need to respond to the, the COVID crisis and, and deal with, uh, with that. But I think we need to look long term as to how do we address homeless situation in a permanent way so we don't have to be in the situation again if we, if we were to face another pandemic. I think that's, that's okay. what we're trying to do. Thank, thank you. you so uh, thank you all on that uh, round. Uh, Mr. Morantz, uh, followed by Mr. Fragascottis. Uh, Marty? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Siddle and uh, Ms. Bowers for being here. Very interesting discussion. Um, Mr. Siddle, just going back to some of your opening remarks, you had indicated yes. that 12% uh, of insured mortgage holders had elected to defer. Yeah. Presumably that means a large percentage of those would have been into default uh, had that not happened. There's also the issue of uh, the uninsured mortgage market, uh, which you, you don't have yeah. anything really to do with. But um, there is likely, uh, similarly, I don't know the number, but a high level of defaults in that market as well. Do you have any uh, sense or idea of, uh, now also you mentioned it's a temporary deferral, which means presumably yeah. these borrowers are going to have to pay at some point. Yeah. What, what do you think this is going to have in terms of effect on the foreclosure and, and mortgage sale numbers going forward? So uh, it's a complicated question. Um, mercifully, I get to think about it all the time. The 12% I gave you deferrals is for insured and uninsured mortgages. So it incorporates numbers that we published and those from the Canadian Bankers Association. Um, uh, some of that, I wouldn't associate even all, half of that with, uh, with losses or foreclosures. Um, people, this is people dealing with uncertainty and conserving cash, just like they hoarded toilet paper. Um, because they could, because banks were offering, and we were. Basically, if you said you're having a hard time, we said take a deferral. Um, and so that, that compassion is what's happened. And, and I've got to give the banks credit. They've done it on uninsured mortgages in addition to insured mortgages. And our two private competitors were lockstep with us, Canada Guarantee and Gemworth Canada. Um, th the impact is going to be that th those mortgage deferred payments are added to the principal outstanding. And so it increases our indebtedness. And that's one of the causes is, behind the numbers I gave you. Is that um, been agreed to by the banks or is that, is that the way, what's going to happen? That they'll be that's capitalized? That's contractually. That's contractually that what They'll happens. be capitalized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, um, you also mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, I, uh, I want to circle around to a couple of things, really, a few topics around cost. So yeah. um, in the last number of meetings, we had the opportunity to talk to both the governor of the Bank of Canada and uh, Mr. Giroux, the PBO. Both yeah. have said that uh, they think interest rates are going to go up. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that as well. I know no one has a crystal ball, but uh, you know, I wouldn't over. I wouldn't substitute my views for those of the government. Yeah, yeah those are those are pretty uh, pretty strong views. Uh, you did mention at the opening in your opening remarks that you wanted to look at adjusting your underwriting policies. I presume that meant to make them more strict, but I, I want to hear from you just to get clarification on that. Um, and also whether or not you anticipate CMHC premiums will go up for consumers as well. In other words, is it going to become more expensive and more difficult for Canadians to uh, attain the dream of home ownership, or is it going to become more difficult because of these factors? My, you can see my bodily reaction when I hear this dream of home ownership thing come up because that um, the, uh, that view, unfortunately, trees don't go to the sky, and what's going to happen is the musical chairs game is going to come to an end. And young people who are very highly leveraged, in fact, if they get an insured mortgage, they're borrowing at something like 83 or 85 to 1. Um, and that's before they borrowed their down payment from their parents or from their RSP or things like that. So, um, well, let, uh, let's extract the dream of home ownership from my question so you're not stuck on that. Yeah. Uh, I could just get an answer uh, from you uh, with respect to the substance of the question. Yeah. So we are... We can look at a bunch of things. We can look at pricing, certainly. We can look at uh, down payment requirements. We can look at credit score requirements. Um, all of those things are on the table. We're actually doing some work right now. And, I, and because we're doing that work right now, I didn't want to keep that information from the committee. And so I included it in my statement. We're talking to our board of directors this week about all those variables and what we can do. Do you think CMHC fees might go up? They, not in the short run, because our pricing work actually takes a long time and we have to look at an economic cycle, yeah. um, but we yeah. may restrict the business we do in the short run. Now, the $2 billion dividend, is that an annual thing? Is it, a, is it every year you give a dividend or is it unusual? Or It's unusual. Number? Well, um, it used to be unusual. So over the last 10 years, we've earned about $17 billion of profit that go to reduce the deficit. That's incorporated into the federal government accounts. Uh, off to the side, we accumulate cash. And if that cash doesn't go back to the government, we sit on the cash and invest it. That's dumb because it can be used to repay debt. So we paid a special dividend, uh, someone will correct me, uh, two years ago, I think, of $4 billion. Maybe it was last year. And we were scheduled to pay another $2 billion. In addition to that, we pay a regular dividend. 
and that's basically to just make sure the money goes to retiring debt instead of sitting burning money in my pockets, if you will. Okay. So, but the government would have received a two billion dollar dividend, maintain that instead of for liquidity purposes, Mr. That's Chair. Just uh, one uh, one other quick one.